Here we are. What a day we've had so far. So much to think about. My brain is getting bigger and bigger, at least, well, at least fuller and fuller <laughs> as, as, as we go. <laughs> no, je suis tout à fait d'accord. En effet, um... I quite agree. Uh, I've learned a lot today. And uh, what I really appreciated is that uh, we've uh, uh, discussed uh, lived experiences uh, for uh, the people, the interveners, things coming from science and reality, but we've also uh, uh, talked about human beings, individuals uh, who uh, talked about uh, inspirational uh, work they're doing. And uh, even uh, before the uh, uh, camera came on, we had an interesting discussion about how there are many ways uh, to uh, launch uh, the circular economy, even if we we know that uh, circularity not, should not be a punishment. So, ça, ça entre dans, le, dans la discussion de la justice environnementale aussi. En gros. So this comes back into uh, the uh, the topic of, of, of a, uh, a fairness and equality. Um, getting used to what we what we need as opposed to what we want, wow. and making that adjustment as we as we wow. go, and starting to think about what is the if I buy this jacket, mm -hmm. what is the future of this jacket, mm -hmm. and just changing the way that we engage and, and interact. So wow. lots today and lots to come, and we have a pack session ahead for you. And kicking us off is the chair of the Council of Canadian Academies Expert Panel on the Circular Economy. She's also the Canada Research Chair in business sustainability at the Ivy Business School at Western University, none other than Tima Bansa. Hello, I'm honored to be setting the scene for the, as a keynote on an issue of which I care deeply, SMEs as game changers for the circular economy. Let me start by asking, so why focus on SMEs as game changers? After all, we spend most of our time and attention Think about the big corporations, the Apples, the Coca-Colas, the Shell Oils. In this keynote, I want to be able to address the critical role of SMEs in the circular economy. And I want to start by emphasizing the importance of the SME sector. The SME sector is bigger than most people realize. They employ 50% of people in the world, and seven out of 10 jobs in the emerging markets are in SMEs. The second reason why I think SMEs are important is because they're agile. The circular economy is going to be disruptive and large corporations are going to be some of the losers in the space. And so they will resist either deliberately or just because of their sheer size as they move towards circularity. Look at the economy now. A lot of the extractive sector, the take, make, take, make waste economy, the take part is really heavily uh, filled with the large corporations. Large corporations care about efficiency and growth, so they're unable to adapt quickly, they're inflexible, and so they can't deal with variability in quality and demand. And they seek efficiency rather than flexibility. I wanna give you an example of what the SME sector can do. And this example really hits home, drives home what, what, why the SME sector is gonna be game changing. I'm gonna give the example from Canada. 40% of food is wasted in Canada. That's $27 billion. But there are examples of SMEs that are changing that scenario. And I draw an example from Guelph, Ontario, which is in Southwestern Ontario. There's a brewery called Wellington Brewery, and they send their spent grain to an organization called Eureka Solutions, which is a company that uh, breeds insects. And so the spent grain is food for insects. The insects are then fed as fish food to, trout, to Izumi agri aquaculture. And the trout then become food for people the fish poop from uh, Izumi aquaculture goes to a potato farm, Smoid potato farm in Fergus, where they use it as fertilizer to grow the potatoes. The extra spent grain from Wellington actually then goes into a bread maker, Grain Revolution Escarpment Labs, to make sourdough. And all of this you can have at the Woolly Pub in Guelph 
which serve fish and chips with beer and bread, and it's all local and it's all circular. That is what SMEs can do. They can be our future vision. A colleague of mine, Yuri Guilandres, has studied 50 of these business to business partnerships among SMEs in the agri food sector. He has found that the one thing that makes SMEs really effective is that they're agile. And they're agile in various ways, but three in particular. One is that SMEs are better at partnering. So you can be sitting at the pub and having over fish and chips, sparking conversations, thinking about who else you could partner with, and really building those relationships. Second, SMEs are really good at product design. And so over fish and chips, you can talk about new types of bread that you might want or how to use different types of protein for insect food. You can also talk about adjustments in the supply chain. So if there is a shortage of insects, what other proteins can be used? And I think SMEs are special in that way because they can be flexible and adjust. And this brings heterogeneity and terroir to our, our system. It brings local. The paradigm is shifting from major corporations through the circular economy. It's moving towards SMEs. Whereas corporations focus on efficiency, SMEs build resiliency. Where corporations focus on competition control, SMEs are building cooperation and collaboration. Where corporations are focusing on the global, SMEs bring in the local. Where corporations think about profit and growth, SMEs are thinking about lots of different objectives. As the waters become increasingly turbulent, I think that it becomes even more important than SMEs step up and take a role. The corporate steamships of the past are being disrupted by the more agile and desirable SME sailing ships. I look to the forward to the conversation of this panel. Thank you. Wow. Quel bel début à notre What a great start to our uh, session on uh, increasing uh, the circular economy. This gives us another way to uh, uh, conceive uh, things that aren't actually uh, linked to uh, uh, food. It could be uh, clothing or it could be uh, secondhand uh, uh, clothes. But what happens when you integrate uh, circularity into the uh, creation, into the purchase of uh, new clothes? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, to uh, Professor Bansal. It was very interesting, and I learned something new uh, uh, from a, a city not far from us, Guelph. Views starting with two circular small and medium enterprises. If anyone who's been watching us was questioning what is an SME, <laughs> yeah. it is a small and medium enterprise. It's very often used in Canadian policies. I don't know how widespread it is, but voila. Um, so we have a bunch of interviews with two circular small and medium enterprises. One is a startup and the other recently celebrated his 20th birthday. So got some staying power too. And after those interviews, we're going to hear from an impact investor focused on funding circular small and medium enterprises. Good day to everybody. I'm Elisa Tonda, head of the Consumption and Production Unit at UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. And today I'll be with uh, Tom Zaki, the CEO and founder of TerraCycle and Loot. And what we will be concentrating on today is what we need to scale circular business module, particularly for small and medium enterprises, SMEs. And we will also dive a little bit deeper, deeper in one specific uh, business model, which is the reuse model. And all of that with uh, Tom. Welcome, Tom, to the World Circular Economy Forum. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. And Tom, let's start with maybe a very basic question. For those who do not know TerraCycle, can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely, be my pleasure. So TerraCycle has been around for 20 years, uh, today operating in 21 countries nationally. One, Thailand is a nonprofit, and 
the rest as a mission-driven for-profit. And our goal is really to move from linear systems, you know, the take-make waste uh, systems, uh, to fundamentally circular ones. And so TerraCycle does that by helping companies recycle things that are traditionally hard to recycle, then helping companies make their products or packages out of uh, hard to recycle waste, and most recently, helping shift from disposable uh, uh, production cycles, where perhaps recycling is the best thing we can do, to reuse-based uh, 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 consumption cycles, where we can tighten that circular economy even more. That's our loop platform. And well, let me start congratulating for the 20th anniversary of uh, uh, TerraCycle. And maybe just moving back then to 20 years ago, where the idea of TerraCycle emerged from? It's a good question. You know, for me, I've always had the love of entrepreneurship ever since a very young age. Uh, and I had this, you know, big turning point in uh, my first year at university. Uh, I took a class on economics and the professor asks a very appropriate opening question, which is, what's the purpose of business? And the answer she was looking for was maximizing profit to shareholders. And that felt a little uninspired, let's say. And I, uh, I started really reflecting on the role of profit. I landed on it's an indicator of health. You know, the more profitable you are, the more you will flourish, grow, and uh, uh, and be around for a while. And obviously, the opposite if you're not. But is that really the purpose? And so I was seeking to try to create a for-profit enterprise that put purpose first. And for me, the topic of waste is uh, has been a lifelong fascination because. It is an incredibly big topic. I mean, everything we possess will belong to a garbage company one day. It's sort of scary when you think about it that way. And the level of innovation relative to how big of an idea that is, it's it's quite low, uh, probably because we're repulsed by the waste industry, because it is not just metaphorically, but actually smelly, dirty, nasty, all those things in real life. And so I feel like it's a great opportunity to be purposeful um, uh, uh, through the concept of business. True, true, Tom, a very nice description of uh, what waste industry is currently associated to in our imagination. And as you also already alluded to, from the beginning 20 years ago until now, TerraCycle has evolved and has transformed itself, has started new path. Can you tell us a little bit about this learning process we ha you had? Absolutely. And I think this is one of the exciting things about putting mission at the center. So uh, what I mean by that is when we first started, uh, you know, I left university and uh, we started as a consumer product company making products out of waste, figuring that was a great way to start that journey on eliminating the idea of waste. And for us, that began by taking organic scraps, feeding it to worms, taking the resulting worm poop, uh, making that into a fertilizer and then selling that at, you know, Walmart, Home Depot and those sort of places. And we realized that by putting the product as the hero of our business, we're going to try to make the very best products, which also means you're going to pick the very best garbage, which also means you're not going to take things like dirty diapers and cigarette butts and things we do today. So we shifted our, our business, you know, about four years in to really focus on garbage as the hero. And then every time we've developed solutions, well, first, of course, recycling, hard to recycle waste streams, then the question always emerged, what can come next? And so the next evolution from there was not just collecting and recycling into something else, but how do we collect and recycle these difficult to recycle waste streams back into primary uh, products? Um, and that actually then led four years ago to asking the question, is recycling even the answer to all of this? And as a recycling company, I would say that recycling is critically important but it's a band-aid to the issue. Uh, uh, we need to come up with systems, and that's where Loop emerged, where you don't have waste at the end, and you really try to shrink as much as possible uh, the amount of effort to, to rejuvenate a product, to have that go to the very next person. And of course, that breeds to the, or you know, leads to the white elephant in the room that the fundamental answer to most environmental issues, especially waste, is lowering consumption altogether. <laughs> and. Uh, there's a great question of how do you even achieve that in the context of business? And we're still thinking that one through a little bit. And, and Tom, you're leading me to a, a following question to you, which is in this path, in this res evolution of your thinking and in, uh, let's say, changing and shifting towards more innovative solution, did you face challenges and how did you go about addressing those challenges? 
Absolutely. Um, I think the biggest lesson I can share in having done this now for a while is as a circular economy uh, or, or, or mission driven business, you know, we have to go out there like any business and convince stakeholders to adopt the thinking. We have to convince uh, uh, in our world, brands and retailers, especially to adopt this frame of view. And then we have to get consumers to participate. And originally, when I approached it, I was approaching it uh, you know, we go to a company and say, isn't it great that we can now technically recycle that object you make? And uh, can you please fund us so we can go set up programs to do so? And we were only able to get so far. When we really thought about um, the question, not from our point of view, but from their point of view, you know, what is the company trying to do? What are their biggest struggles right now? What are they looking to achieve, which may be as simple as gain market share, or if you're a retailer, drive more foot traffic. The moment we reframed our programs in that light, it uh, resonated much better with uh, with the corporate interests. And so it, it became easier to get them to divert funding away from traditional advertising and to perhaps recycle. The same thing is, is a key lesson in consumers. You know, in the sustainability movement, I think we are very much aiming to an aspirational state of mind, you know, that consumers will be better, will sacrifice, will eat less meat, for example, or use different modes of transport, so on and so forth. And that is challenging because consumers aspire to it, but then don't actually execute it. And so what is really important is, again, to empathize with what consumers in their deep hearts want, which is first and foremost convenience, then lots of features and benefits and all of that packed at an affordable price. And notice I didn't even use the word sustainability there. But I think the more we can accept, uh, and this has been the big learning for us, how the actors move, then we can actually create platforms that allow them to be much more sustainable uh, ideally, in many cases, without even realizing it. And Tom, you're leading me then to positioning ourselves in the future and asking you where your ambition is going forward. Maybe where do you see yourself and, and TerraCycle and, and Loop in, in five years' time? And maybe what will be the key element that will help you achieve that vision? Absolutely. So, I mean, we've seen, even during COVID, uh, uh, phenomenal growth, uh, which is really driven by consumer sentiment, is really waking up. And that gives me a lot of optimism that folks are really caring more and more about the environment. And that's fundamentally measurable, not even opinion based. I, I think that as long as we can provide things that appeal you know, to, to the instincts I mentioned earlier, then there's a bright future in how quickly these sort of platforms can grow. And we measure ourselves at how much waste that otherwise would end up in landfills or incinerators are we able to collect and recycle. And in reuse, how much are we moving people away from disposable uh, methods of consumption to reusable methods. And for a business, I, I would say that because the issue is there and people are are aware of it uh, more and more and holding that center, I think there's a bright future in that sense. But I really want to highlight that it's not the answer, right? Um, we have to, as individual citizens, have a major reflection on our relationship with consumption. Because while the environmental challenges that face our planet today are incredibly complex and diverse, they all emanate from one center point, which is we vote for them repeatedly by buying things. And there is no good purchase. There is just less bad purchases. And so we have to really uh, 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 center on that point, because if not, we will just keep moving business to be more sustainable, but we won't have to address the underlying root cause of the environmental trauma that we are living through right now. And Tom, as we're about to wrap up our interview, I just would want to conclude with an advice from you to SMEs and entrepreneurs who are now starting their journey towards a circular business model, what would you recommend to them? You know, I think many folks will say that, you know, of course, you have to think about circular and sustainable in the future. Um, uh, but it is also incredibly powerful. Uh, 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 it will make your business significantly stronger, more resilient, attract better talent. Only really good things will come. Uh, and it is the future. And so I would strongly recommend folks center on that uh, and uh, think about how their business can usher in a more sustainable future versus just keeping the status quo. Thank you very much. And with these advice and recommendation as a conclusion. Tom, I thank you very much for your time today. 
Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Hamilton. I'm director of clean tech at Mars Discovery District, North America's largest urban innovation hub. We're a nonprofit organization that works with more than 1200 early stage companies from across Canada, providing business advisory support and, and valuable connections to customers, capital and partners. And basically, our mission is to help companies make the world a better place by accelerating their growth and amplifying their impact. We're joined today by Luna Yu, founder and CEO of Genesis Bio Industries, a Toronto-based company that's turning food waste into high-quality compo compostable plastics. The topic of our discussion is financing circular innovation and in SMEs, and as part of that, we'll highlight how it is for companies. We'll highlight how important it is for companies to get the business model right. Welcome, Luna. Thank you for having me today, Tyler. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Luna, can you briefly introduce us to yourself and to kick us off, describe at a high level what Genesis does? Sure. So my name is Luna Yu, CEO and founder of Genesis Bio Industries. At Genesis, we make compostable plastics from food waste. Great. Now, we know each other well. Mars has been working with you and your team at Genesis for roughly three years. Um, so, but for the benefit of our audience, can you tell us how the idea for Genesis first came about and what you're trying to achieve as well as what it was like during your earliest days as a circular economy startup? Absolutely. So originally we got the idea back in 2016 during my master's at the University of Toronto when I was working with biogas plants who converted food waste into renewable natural gas. But roughly a week into it, I was quickly informed they struggled to make a profit. So I thought, well, why not take the really valuable carbons from food waste, feed it to more efficient bacteria to make a higher value product instead? And that was the genesis of Genesis. And our early days were really just quite comical. So back in 2017, we just started and couldn't afford expensive bioreactors. We had to build them ourselves out of rice cookers. We also struggled to find a proper lab space to run our reactors. So what we did was we ran them in our garage, of course, and also a few public washrooms. That was quite a sight. That's very interesting. Um, rice cookers, I, I remember a lot of those in university. Um, it's not easy growing a company from scratch and the circular economy space is no exception. R&D is hard, working with big industry can be a challenge and of course finding the right capital you need to, to grow consumes enormous amounts of time and energy. Um, what do you personally look for for inspiration and what gets you through your toughest days as a CEO of a circular economy startup? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, startup programs like the Women in Clean Tech Challenge hosted by Mars and NRCAD really got us through our toughest days and continuously provides inspiration to us. So for example, they quite literally saved our company back in 2018. That was when a lot of investors that we came across thought we were nothing but a cool science project. <laughs> and in September of 2018, we had only roughly two weeks of cash left in our bank accounts. And although we were prepared to keep going and live off of ramen for the next coming months, it's just it wasn't the ideal situation to be in. And fortunately, that's when the Women in Clean Tech Challenge took place. The very next week that we were selected as a finalist, we took their $250,000 cash contribution and secured it against a loan. And that really saved our company. So fast forward to today, we raised over $11 million total and grew our team now to 25 people full time. But we know we cannot have gotten here without programs like what the Women in Clean Tech Challenge. Well, thanks for saying that. And I know there's other supports that exist throughout the Canadian uh, clean tech ecosystem. Um, but it's nice to hear that Mars has been delivering that value. Uh, what would you say is your biggest barrier to growth at the moment? Are there any market or behavioral changes that are needed that would help take your business to the next level? Really good question. So really, personally, I think our biggest barrier to growth is really just not maintaining a laser focus. Uh, the market, on the other hand, for us has really exploded recently. So for example, last year, we had a huge surge in demand for our biocompostable plastics, PHAs. So we went from $0 in revenues to closing nearly a million dollars today, paired with $10 million of future purchase orders. And the issue, though, was that in order for us to work with these customers, it meant that we had to make a lot more of our PHAs. 
But there were a lot of our process last year and this year, especially on the larger scales, that weren't optimized yet. So back then, we made a pretty bad decision to basically move forward with all of them at once. And doing this just really slowed down our progress. We had spread our attention over 10 different projects at the same time, and we couldn't get really good results on any of them. And it wasn't until just recently that this lesson finally sunk in for us. So what we did was we reprioritized, identified parts of our process that can be outsourced, and we made sure that everyone on our team was aligned back in a laser focused state. And just now things are really picking back up again. That's super interesting to hear because it is something that we uh, struggle with when we're advising a lot of the ventures that we work with that they get overextended. And for small companies that have limited uh, teams, um, it's it's sometimes tempting to go after the, the dangly lures, like the, the new projects, which kind of take you and veer you off course. Um, and, but eventually, yeah, you really do have to keep that focus. So I'm glad, I'm glad you learned that lesson uh, at, at this stage because uh, keeping focus is going to be very important for you going ahead. Um, as you look ahead, uh, speaking of looking ahead, how do you plan to fund Genesis' next phase of growth? Uh, right now, you're, you're doing a, a fundraising at the moment. Um, obviously, there's going to be more going down the road. Um, what's your, what's your kind of roadmap for that? Yeah, great question. So at Genesis, we always want to grow with an equal amount of funding from customer revenues, grants, and equity fundraised. So in the last three years, we've actually been able to achieve a two to one ratio in terms of capital efficiency. We raised roughly $3.5 million in equity, but received over $7.5 million in grants and revenues. So going forward, we're really looking to just replicate this model moving forward as well. That's interesting. And that's going to feed into another question about the importance of trying to get as much non dilutive funding through grants. There's a lot of government support out there. Has that been really valuable for you? 100%. We've really been able to leverage the grants out there and also gotten a lot of support from Mars as well as in our can to actually get a lot more of these funding throughout the last couple of years. That's great to hear. Um, one thing I want to know, uh, which is very important to your business model, but it's I think it's also relevant for a lot of other circular economy uh, startups, is the importance of having a capital light scaling strategy um, built into your own business model. Can you explain the approach that Genesis has taken and, and how that kind of sets you up for success? 100%. So Tyler, this one is super important because in the biotech industry, if you want to mass produce your product, it usually costs you up to $500 million and takes up to five years to set up a single production plant, right? That's a lot of money and a very long time. Now, Genesis wants to overcome this challenge by adopting a decentralized scaling strategy where we essentially piggyback our technology as an add-on unit to the existing infrastructure biogas plants who has a very similar setup to ours. And we're super happy to announce that as of last month, we were awarded a $6 million project from Engine to integrate our demonstration plants with one of the largest biogas plants in Canada, Stormfisher. We actually met through a Mars connection. And if this project succeeds, it can prove out a new decentralized scaling model that can help companies like us in the biotech industry scale five times faster than a fraction of the cost. So if things work out well with a company like Stormfisher, I guess the, the number of, of biogas uh, developers worldwide is fairly large, right? Have you kind of looked at that space? Like, do you see um, being able to piggyback on that approach as being um, uh, that success to long-term growth? Oh, 100%. There's over 200,000 biogas plants worldwide, and they combined can process the 1.3 billion tons of food waste that's generated per year, every single year by the entire human population right now. Great, great. And just the last question I, I wanted to get clarification from, from you on, and I'm sure some members of the audience are thinking this, you're making PHA plastics out of food waste. Can you give us examples of the types of products that can be made from PHAs and why they're superior than, than other plastics? Great question. So PHAs actually are very, very similar in terms of properties to polypropylene and polyethylene, which means that they can actually replace 60% of the world's petroleum plastics that are used today. Right now for Genesis right now, we're actually just focused on the ultra premium markets in the 3D printing filament industry, premium food packaging and medical sectors. 
And in the future, as we continue to bring our costs down and achieve economies of scale, we'll then be able to replace all the everyday plastics that you see right now, like forks, knives, Lego blocks, so on and so forth. So it's super, super exciting, and we're going to take it step by step. That is very fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm sorry we have to cut our conversation short, but that was uh, a, a great, great explanation of what you do. And I'm glad we've been able to help you on your journey so far. So thanks very much, Luna. Awesome. Thank you, Tyler. Hi, I'm Michelle Brownlee. I'm the Director General of Clean Technology and Clean Growth at the Canadian Ministry of Innovation, Science and Economic Development. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined in conversation by April Crow. As a globally recognized sustainability leader, April has more than two decades of experience working throughout the value chain in a diverse set of roles in sustainability, scientific and regulatory affairs and quality. She helped launch Circulate Capital in 2018 and leads investor relations and external affairs. Hi, April. Hi, Michelle. So let's jump right in. April, tell us who you are and about Circulate Capital and Circulate Capital Disrupt. Uh, thank you. First of all, I just have to say it's an honor to be included as a part of this forum, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So Circulate Capital is an investment management firm dedicated to preventing plastic from leaking into the ocean and advancing a more circular economy. Our goal is to prove the investment case to catalyze a significant amount of capital into local companies that address the ocean plastic issue while advancing the circular economy. We raised just over $100 million to invest in startups and small to medium-sized enterprises across the plastic value chain, starting in South and Southeast Asia, both to reduce plastic pollution and also demonstrate that investing in the circular economy can generate attractive financial returns. So far, the fund has been focused on India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines, five of the countries where economic growth has outpaced the critical waste infrastructure that's needed. And these countries are also considered some of the largest sources of plastic leakage in the ocean. We're working to develop evidence-based track records, a pipeline of investable opportunities, and products to help provide an on-ramp for additional investment. The Ocean Fund uh, by Circulate Capital was launched in 2019, and we just recently announced Circulate Capital Disrupt. It's a companion strategy fund that will invest in targeted innovations, both in materials and deep technology solutions. These will also be focused on combating plastic waste, advancing the circular economy, and then also a large focus on reducing overall climate impact. So it sounds like you're in the business of turning uh, challenges into opportunities. Some of the world's biggest companies are major investors in your fund. Uh, why did you choose to focus on startups? Yeah, um, yeah, as you notice, our investors are some of the leading companies in the world, including PepsiCo, P&G, Dow, Unilever, Chanel, Danone, Coca-Cola, and CP Chem. We, along with them, see opportunities across the plastic waste management value chain, starting downstream with the processing and reuse of plastic to more early stage opportunities upstream, both with the collection and sorting of plastics. And we know that waste is often managed locally and local businesses are really on the front lines of fighting plastic pollution. We see an opportunity for them to turn local plastic waste into business opportunities that also benefit the environment and their local communities. As we've looked across Asia, we've spoken to more than 300 entrepreneurs and disruptors who are not only preventing plastic from entering the ocean, but are also showing that returning that recycled commodity back to the supply chain can be profitable. Entrepreneurs like investors and corporations have the opportunity to help solve a great challenge while also capturing the economic value. 300 entrepreneurs is quite impressive. So how do you choose which startups to fund? Do you provide other types of support as well? Do you have strings attached? What's your, what's your method? So we do have a broad set of criteria. It, our fund is a little bit unique. And as we're looking at potential investments, it includes their business operating model, understanding their long-term strategy, 
the financial situation of the business their, and their leadership, who's running the team today. And in addition to the potential financial return on in the investment, which is pretty critical, we want to ensure that each investment is scalable and can be easily replicated in other locations. We try to make sure that we're co-investing alongside other sources of capital. And then we're also looking at the environmental impact, looking at areas like preventing plastic pollution, diverting waste from the environment, and potential climate impact reduction ever, efforts. Um, in addition, we're looking at overall societal benefits, including business models that support economic and community growth. Uh, you asked the question around what else we're providing other than funding. As you heard, our funders are quite unique. Um, and we want to leverage these, these large brands. Um, and these companies are not only providing their financial resources for these investments, but they're also using um, the opportunity to, to share their technical knowledge, their global supply chain knowledge, basic business knowledge to the companies that we're investing in. We think this is ultimately what will help us make these companies more successful and more su sustainable in the long run. Would you mind telling us about some of the amazing circular startups that you've supported? Um, I'd also be curious to know what are some of the common barriers that they face and some successful strategies that others could copy? Yeah, so um, we think about this space, innovation and technology are not typical words that you immediately think of when you think about waste and recycling, which is the space that we're working in right now. But what we know is that technology and innovative recycling solutions are a critical part of fostering the circular economy ecosystem and creating that enabling environment for businesses to succeed. It's important um, that we see this innovation and continue to drive change, whether it's through innovative materials, redesign of processes, um, or coming up with ways to, to track and manage waste flows. Very you know, basic things, but where you can bring this element of innovation. We've seen a lot of great um, potential solutions, some we've invested in, some that we haven't, um, you know, some that are very unique. Uh, one that we saw recently was around uh, trash collecting robots with AI vision technology to detect and collect trash from bodies of water. And, you know, they're bringing an approach that is much more efficient than traditional systems. And it's that type of, you know, creative, innov innovative ways to deploy different types of technology. Uh, that we're really uh, looking for when we look at it from an innovation standpoint. But some are, are a little bit more basic. Um, startups that are, again, using technology, but supporting in cities their existing informal waste infrastructures, which is what we see, particularly in the part of the world that we're working in. Some of our first investments have been focused on taking business models that exist and then adding additional technology or equipment to make um, higher quality end products, um, things that will help increase the value. So it ultimately helps increase their business opportunity. And a couple of the investments that we've made have focused on things like difficult to recycle plastics. And then another one that's really using scaling digitization um, and creating an e-waste commerce platform. In terms of challenges, you know, it, 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 they face the same um, challenges that, that many others do in building strong teams. Um, you know, we've all experienced the implications of a global pandemic as you're trying to create a startup. So being able to leverage and getting very um, tapping into those entrepreneurial roots and coming up with ways to pivot and tap into the resources that they have in their communities and looking for ways that their business model may need to shift in terms of what they're selling or where they're accessing material um, has been something that these companies have had to quickly uh, deploy and um, has helped them really weather the storms that many companies have faced um, in recent weeks and months. That really resonates with me and the work that I'm doing to support Canadian innovators in this, this space. I suspect many of these challenges are global right now. Um, but Circulate Capital is focused on Southeast Asia, as you mentioned. Do you have any reflections on what policymakers and investors in other emerging markets can do to also incubate and scale up bond mock circular innovation? Yeah, you know, with these, um, you know, we're trying to look at it um, in terms of both the 
social, environmental, and financial return aspects, because a lot of people ask, you know, can you reconcile um, both those considerations along with the, the financial side. And uh, that's an area that we need to look at is how do we ensure right now when financial markets um, are looking more on short term often and not creating uh, really evaluating the true sustainability risks that are at play. So creating an environment where you can build those longer term processes um, to help build that resiliency and that longer term um, focus. Uh, for, for our work at Circulate Capital, we are really focused on how we can demonstrate again that these things are not mutually exclusive um, and that we are promoting a circular economy and building these systems where we can catalyze that additional investment. So looking for ways that the blended finance can come to bear. We have some examples of that already of where you have public and private um, dollars and partnerships coming together. So there's a real opportunity, I think, for um, governments and policymakers to take a closer look at that. As a government, that rings very true to me, and I definitely appreciate that comment. April, we wish you and your innovators the very best of luck with all of your projects. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. This is all absolutely fascinating. This is all absolutely fascinating. I think what's really interesting is, you know, we're talking about small and medium enterprises. We're talking about business. We're talking about business models. And what's really great is the honesty of the people who we're speaking with. They are letting us know that it's not easy to create a business that supports a circular economy, that is circular in its values, and it is circular in the way it functions. It's not easy. In fact, not even it's not easy, it's absolutely difficult. But according to what we're listening to, according to what we're hearing, it's worth doing, and it's possible. And it's not just possible, but it's possible to be fully successful in doing it, which is really exciting. So I hope that the difficulty that we're witnessing and that is being spoken of so candidly also serves as motivation for those of you who are in business and wanting to maybe transform your business into a more um, circular model or those of you who are looking to maybe start up or even those of you who have had a startup and you're currently facing some of those pitfalls, limitations, difficulties and barriers. Um, so yeah, let's keep going. I'd like to introduce you now to Kevin Moss, uh, who is the Global Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the World Resources Institute. That is a long title. Yes, it is. Incredibly long, but <laughs> very much worth it. Um, and Because he will be moderating a roundtable discussion on how to accelerate the circular small-medium enterprise transition. So off to you, Kevin. Catherine. Chuck Catherine, thank you so much. We we go by WRI because it's a little quicker than than the full the full name of the organisation. Um, we have been invited to reflect on what it would take to make circularity mainstream for small and medium enterprises. I am thrilled to have a deep and broad expertise on the panel today. Um, we only just have time to even touch on the the depth and, and breadth of the expertise of our speakers, but I hope we can do as much justice as possible in the the time we've got, I'm going to quickly introduce everybody to you. We have Jan Rice, who is the Global Sustainability Advisor for ABN Amro's Bank in the Netherlands, and the lead author for the intriguingly titled UNEP report, Demystifying Circular Economy Finance. Jan, great to have you with us. Dr. Arab Obalar, who is Executive Director of SEED, a global partnership for action on sustainable development and the green economy. Um, Arab's been leading work on sustainable production and consumption and sustainable lifestyles for 25 years before many of us had even heard of those terms. Thank you for everything you've done for the, for the field, Arab, and for your words that I know are going to come today. Um, Ellen McGregor is CEO of Fielding Environmental a chemical and refrigerant recycler, longtime board member of the Sustainable Development Technology Canada, recipient of the Clean Canada 50 Award, and if 
that isn't enough. You write music and song lyrics. I only wish we had time. Maybe even at the end, you'll give us a couple of a couple of verses from a song if we can find the time to allow for it. And Kristen, Crispin Conroy. Crispin has had a long career in diplomacy, in the trade and industry space, including early in your career, Crispin, um, Australia's ambassador to Nepal, I believe. And you, But you are here today representing the International Chamber of Commerce, which represents over 45 million companies of every size in over 100 companies, in over 100 countries. I'm Kevin. In Moss, I lead the sustainable, um, the Centre for Sustainable Business at WRI. The centre includes PACE, the platform for accelerating circular economy, and P4G, the platform for green growth and the global goals, which has a grant making component for circular economy, and also a big piece of work we've done recently for the CCICED, the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment, that also focused in on the role of circular economy. So this work is, is central to our work as well. So we each represent a piece of the circular economy innovation puzzle. And our job today is to do our best in the time available to bring these pieces together. Um, Arab, I'm going to ask you to go first and draw on your experience working at the local level. How do we, a broad question for everybody, but for you first, how do we create an enabling environment for bottom-up circular innovation? What's the first step towards building an ecosystem for circularity to thrive? And Arab, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, the first speaker uh, have highlighted the importance of the SMEs as game changer, and this is the purpose of our discussion. And she said SMEs should step, step up to take the game changer role. Very easy to say, extremely difficult to do. And I will tell you, I will say why. Mainly because what you are asking for, Kevin, we are missing the enabling environment. We need to properly manage it and set it. When seed launched in 2000 uh, by UNEP, UNDP, and IUCN for promoting entrepreneurship for sustainable development. The world was stressing the need to think global and act local. While most discussions and agreements were about thinking global, understanding the needs and challenges for acting local were not well advanced. The seed partnership aimed at coping with the challenges for delivering local level with local partners and entrepreneurs. Almost 20 years later, SEED has accumulated, along the, 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 exp the cases we have heard about, accumulated relevant knowledge with practical cases demonstrating in various countries and in hand with hundreds of SMEs what it means to act local, what it entails, and how to induce and support SMEs. This is well documented on our website. With tailored and relevant assistance to SMEs, we can help them getting better organized, become more efficient. Would they be disruptors with new innovations with access to market? Would they be impacted drivers by delivering through extensive networks or being steady growers with proven business models or finally simply being necessity driven enterprises? SMEs with green and innovative solution play an essential role in the transition towards circular economy. Let me underline here an extremely important word that is also in what you mentioned, transition. Transition which relates to time and transformation, generally not properly fact factored in when designing green and circular economy policies, and through my career, I have been working on a lot of sustainable development strategies. And I will tell you, trans transition period was not properly factored in. And this is mainly because in our case, entrepreneurship has been generally at the edge, not correctly mainstreamed and considered in these strategies. While SMEs can be more circular by necessity, and by agility, as the court said earlier, large than large companies, their innovative approaches cannot be easily scaled up and adapted for application, 
simply because of inappropriate institutional, financial, and market ecosystems with weak bottom-up circle innovation infrastructure. To that end, if government and large companies are really serious about their objectives for climate, it's essential that policymakers, industrial association, and final institutions come together in a common but differentiated responsibility, as we say in the UN, in order to support the SMEs in conceptualizing, financing, and manufacturing the innovative circular products. SMEs cannot and should not be what we call the missing middle. And their importance as backbone of almost all economies, as we all know it, should be explicitly recognized, valued, and pushed up from missing middle to active partners. And I will end up very soon that greening value chains, a, a greener value chains, a duly recognized and value role for the SMEs are cornerstones for green recovery, resilience, and circularity. These go all together. Ultimately, green entrepreneurship is key to circular economy. And besides enabling the SMEs where needed, the government, business, and industry networks have a large responsibility that should be discussed in what I would call the multi-stakeholder dialogue on entrepreneurship to design and establish appropriate policy framework and enabling instrument. Let us walk the talk. Time is running out. Move from circularity as a concept, and we are very much on it at the global level, to circularity as a common practice, as the cases what we have seen demonstrated. SEED has demonstrating it, piloting it. We can move ahead. But we need the right institutional framework for that, that government and large company has to help to set up. Thank you. Arab, thank you very much. I, I take from your, the very beginning the think global, act local, and we will have a chance with Crispin later to come back as well a bit to the policy aspects of this too. I, I also draw out the ideas of you move from transition to transformation, and I just want to pick out a, um, a concept that I think Tima brought out at the very beginning where we sort of started hearing more about disruption as well and the role SMEs have to play in that. Um, Ellen, does this, I'm going to come to you next if I might, does this resonate with your experience as a CEO and also your development on the board of the Sustainable Development Technology Canada? Right, thank you for the question. Hello, everyone. Um, that was a lot of information to un unpack. So to, to try to play back what I heard, I'm just going to divide two camps. Uh, one is the camp of SMEs that are already up, running, operating in Canada. And, the, and then the other is the emerging companies, uh, ones that SDDC would fund. And I'm just going to talk uh, in, in order at those, of those two camps. So, for the for the SMEs that are already doing their thing, they're they're working they're working their buns off in Canada. It's a tough road to hoe to own uh, a business in Canada to grow a business in Canada. Uh, so so what are we going to do for those SMEs to to get them to lift their heads up, to look at what's available uh, in Canada, to adopt technologies that would make their practices more circular in nature. What can we do to help them chase what is out there already and bring it into their environments? So, you know, I, I Arab talked about policymaker and uh, policymakers and legislation. You know, we have so much of our environmental legislation is provincial and not federal, although some of it's federal and um, and, and seems to drop through the cracks. This is this is speaking from experience here, uh, right across Canada. We've got um, to harmonize as a nation so that the policymakers, the legislators across our provinces are working collaboratively to help SMEs understand what's possible and, and make legislation, I'm going to talk to it later, uh, that with some ideas that would help them chase circularity as opposed to feeling it's forced on them. Um, now I'm going to move to the other camp. And the other camp are the emerging technologies that, that we need to enable as a nation. Yes, 
my earlier comment about collaboration of the provinces across this country, absolutely key to that. Uh, we have an ecosystem in, in Canada to spearhead the connections of innovative companies to make them prosper, but we need to do more in that camp. We need to do way more. We need to understand why um, clean tech companies are leaving our country in the chase of other countries that make it more affordable to them uh, to establish uh, or, or access to permits or access to talent. We need to understand all of that and we need to plug the holes. And we need to make it such that this, the CEOs of SMEs understand what's available they're incentivized to acquire the, uh, the technologies that, are ex that exist in this country and that can move us closer to circularity. Ellen, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and you, you talked about what can be heard of from a very Canadian perspective of legislation being provincial, not federal. But I, I, can, I can confirm from my, more, my other perspectives, whether it's Europe, whether it's Africa, whether it's Asia, whether it's the US, I hear very similar sentiments um, of, of the need to harmonize um, across regions within countries and from the perspective of, of business and global business, harmonize across countries and regions of the world as well. So thank you for bringing that out um, for us. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Crispin. I'd love to get your insights here. Um, what roles do trade rules play in helping maintain the status quo of linear business models? And how can we change that? Many thanks, Kevin. Uh, the, the linear take, make, discard approach is still very much the dominant approach to economic activity. And the international trading system has really developed around this model and still is. But there is an increasing interest by business in a, in a more circular approach, especially as we're all focusing on operational models that can drive us towards greater sustainability worldwide. And it's becoming increasingly clear that attention must be given to the role of trade in driving this transition. ICC and, and our business members as the end users of the World Trade Organization rules are strong supporters of this multilateral trading system. And as the principal voice at the WTO, ICC is working towards greater coherence across the various multilateral agendas. Indeed, if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, we urgently need coherence between the environmental and trade agendas. And we must be more active in exploring ways for trade to support and to drive solutions to our global challenges. At ICC, we see a, a greater transition to circular models as being complementary to our action on climate as we work towards a more sustainable and resilient future. But in this context, relatively little is known about the interaction between the circular economy and international trade policy. Which frameworks are enabling of circularity? And by contrast, which are inhibitors to a more sustainable model of production and consumption, for example? Now, these questions, we believe, need evidence-based answers grounded in the experience of the real economy. And it was to this end that ICC Secretary General John Denton announced late last year a major study in partnership with the Institute for International Trade that will explore how trade interacts with the circular economy and it will be providing uh, specific concrete recommendations for WTO action. This study is close to completion and we'll share its preliminary recommendations during the course of this week. So I, of course, have to give a plug for our session, which is on Wednesday at the ICC OECD Accelerator session, where all will be revealed. Uh, one of the key challenges is to how we can work together to use trade rules to improve circularity on a global scale. And indeed, ICC is institutional representative of over 45 million companies, small and medium, as well as large, with a global network in over 100 countries, is ideally placed to play a role. As I said, the ICC report will make recommendations for concrete action at the WTO, including the possibility of negotiations on environmental goods and services agreement and reviving past discussions on remanufactured goods. However, given the difficulties WTO members are facing in reaching consensus in traditional negotiations, we believe soft law or non-binding commitments may be easier to achieve in the short term, and they may well have a more immediate impact in addressing non-tariff measures. 
So we believe that one option may be the definition of a set of common principles and best practices for the establishment of regulatory frameworks, standards or conformity assessment procedures in specific areas related to the circular economy. And I guess this picks up a couple of the themes, themes raised by, by um, previous speakers, by Arab and Ellen. ICC will be actively contributing to this sort of potential solution to the scaling up challenge post MC12, that ministerial conference, utilizing our global network to share and to advocate for the adoption of such common frameworks. And just to conclude, Kevin, there are of course a number of key actors involved in a number of different forums. And I've already mentioned the WTO, which has its own uh, SME working group. ICC also has agreed recently to supercharge our collaboration with the International Trade Center in Geneva around platforms and content to support SMEs globally, and especially in, in developing countries. We've already begun uh, discussions with ITC on how to work with SMEs on the transition to circular business models throughout their networks and ours. And we certainly look forward to working with other partners, including in the private sector, the public sector and civil society. And of course, with our, our partners in, in the, the study, the Institute for International Trade. Thanks. Crispin, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think I heard in your remarks a reflection of, of the asks from, from Arab and um, also um, from Ellen for the need for policy change, for, for, for working together. I, I think that the, the, the trade world perhaps works slower than we'd like, and I'm sure everybody welcomes your use of the word supercharge. Um, and, and that's the more we can help you supercharge these changes, the, the better. Um, Jana, I'm going to come to you um, last in this round. We're going to have a very quick cry round after this. But Jan, I'm going to come to you last to talk about the financing side, even our work at WRI with the China Council, the CCICD, identified even in China that financing is one of the biggest challenges for SMEs in the circular economy space. I know we've heard it from some of our speakers earlier in, in this section, prior to this session. Jan, may, let me hand over to you. What role does financing play in maintaining the state Status quo and how can we change it? Yeah, finance has this peculiar um, habit of being very conservative. And when something new comes along, like the circle economy, which is a shift away from the linear economy, which we've been having um, or we've been growing post World War II, then obviously the finance section of our economy uh, looks at it and uh, is rather puzzled how to do it. Um, I'll make a, a quick plug here when it comes to trading patterns and the effect on circular, circular business models and the SDGs. Uh, we've published a report on behalf of Chatham House called Financing an Inclusive Circular Economy. So look that up and there's a lot to read on how that actually works. But to cut it short, what motivates a CEO of a financial institution to actually go for circular economy as part of their top line strategy. There are three aspects. It is driven by opportunity, and there are some hard numbers here. I mean, in around five years time, it's estimated that waste streams themselves, and that's not even the whole circular economy, that's only part of circular economy, reach a value of 5 trillion US dollars of international trading volume on a yearly basis. That then is larger than the pharmaceutical sector. So you could ask, are you blind if you're not focusing on the circular economy, right? There is opportunity there and also on the SME side, on the large side. Then there's the other part. I think another reason is defensive. Uh, the policy work that banks require, the compliance that they need to prove that they are in compliance with international regulations. Think about the Basel Convention on the transboundary movement of uh, hazardous waste, which is kind of the flip side of what we like to talk about, which is the pretty picture of a circular economy where secondary materials are um, transformed into value. But obviously, there's also this flip side of uh, violation, violations of international conventions where these hazardous wastes are still not a part of the past. And I think policing uh, clients better on that gives financial institutions a better grasp on where they are exposed in this uh, resource 
section of their um, work, of their finest work. And that leads me into the third reason why CEOs should promote circular economy as top line strategy for a circular uh, for a financial institution. It's uh, the risk. I mean, risk is an evolving science. Actually, it's not a science. It's more of an art. So I think financial institutions can run scenarios on how the profit and loss of their clients would evolve if actually policy strictens, as was said by Arab, policy needs to strengthen. Otherwise, we won't have a circular economy. So if the true cost, the true price of the discarded waste streams would be accounted for, what actually is the value of the profit or what remains of the profit of a company? And with increasing environmental regulations, financial institutions need to educate their risk departments, their risk uh, professionals to deeply understand uh, circularity. With that, I think some of the money that they have entrusted to larger institutions or larger clients will move towards SMEs that have a more transparent structure where they're more able to check whether actually they are working according to the rules of the circular economy. I think that transparency also moves money towards uh, SMEs. So it's risk, it's opportunity, and it is policy work integrating the legislative aspects already there into the financial context. Jan, thank you very much. Thank you all for keeping your remarks so crisp. Jan, I think you're telling us the money is there, but it needs to be re moved to the right places um, over time. Well, uh, ideally sooner rather than rather than later. Um, I am going to, with our remaining time, I'm going to change tack a little bit from the barriers and talk about what would incentivize SMEs to go circular? We need to revisit, we need to redesign, we need to think, rethink existing business models. I'm going to refer back to something that Elisa Tonda brought out with Ton Zaki um, in the, one of our, the earlier sessions of this section around the need to revisit even the idea of, of consumption. Um, you, you don't even really have one minute each because we're slightly over. So I'm going to invite you all in a word or a sentence to tell everybody, to tell each other, to tell our, share with our audience, what is the single most important market legislative or behavior change that would result in all SMEs embracing adopting circularity. I'm going to go Crispin, Ellen, um, Arab and Jan, just to give you due, due notice. Crispin, you want to tackle that one first? The single most important change. Given that's, uh, that's tough, not, not fair time-wise. but That's your uh, sentence, Crispin. <laughs> no, go on. Go I'll, on. Go back to, I'll go back to the framework and uh, consistency in the regulatory approaches and, and one of the re main recommendations of, of our study, which is, as I said earlier, the importance of defining a, a set of common principles and best practices for the establishment of those regulatory frameworks and standards, such as EPR schemes, standards, or the implementation of quantitative restrictions. And uh, obviously, Crispin, I'm going to keep us going because I'm being told okay. at the other end we've gone over time. Consistency in approaches. Um, Ellen. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it a little more granular. Um, I'll give you an example of where I think the kinds of thinking that we need to have. Um, if we looked at uh, incentives that were financial for SMEs to chase becoming more circular, and here I would say, if they move uh, to adopting a, uh, an innovation from a Canadian technology company uh, to become more circular, perhaps like the, the SHRED program, there's some kind of mechanism that would provide them cash rebate. If we don't start thinking about incentivizing our SMEs to, to, get, uh, to chase financial incentives, we'll have a tougher road to hoe. Ellen, thank you. Very specific, direct financial incentives for SMEs because that's what's really going to help them um, and, and incentivize them in the right direction. Um, um, Arab. Yes, I think to, we need to absolutely support well the SMEs. And for that, what they need is to have an active communication about what needs to be done. They need to be adequately educated with the appropriate support. And we need to strongly advocate for 
entrepreneurship. So communication and education are essential by recognizing what I call the best in order to move the rest, recognizing the few we know about, show their cases, make the business case in order to induce the rest, the majority of the others to follow. Arab, thank you. So showcase the best performers, the best examples out there to incentivize and, in, and, and encourage others to follow in their pathway. Jan, I'm sorry to put you last again, but there's also a benefit in getting the last word. You yeah. get the last word. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to do. Uh, at the moment, the energy transition is systematically designed in a linear way and not in a circular way. I think for SMEs with a circular ambition, there is great opportunity in re reusing all those secondary resources that will come from when we start really at large scale eliminating fossil fuels from our economic reality. They are not eliminated yet, but they will gradually be. And lots of stuff is coming our way, batteries, solar panels, wind turbines, those all need work. Those need all a circular approach to actually tackle the side effects of them. And I was very proud that the Technical University Eindhoven came up, that's already a year ago, with a fully recyclable solar panel. That's half weight, so it can be put on buildings that don't have the constructive strength, so they're lighter and they're recyclable. I think that type of innovation SMEs need to come forward with. Go for the energy transition and the side effects of the energy transition. Jan, thank you. So innovation, um, innovation and entrepreneurship that we're going to see from, from SMEs. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Met for many of you on our panel tonight, today, it's very late at night. I know we appreciate you joining us. Um, Arab, Crispin, um, Ellen and Jan, I'm now going to th hand things back. Thank you all very much. I'm going to hand things back to our wonderful MCs, um, Chuck and Catherine. Thanks. Yay. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, it's so nice. We're, we're reading through the chat and we're seeing people's ideas. And it's just so interesting to see the dynamic that emerges on these panels. So Kevin, thank you very much for doing such a terrific job emceeing that one. Having fun? Oh, absolutely. It is, it is a delight. It is a pleasure, in fact, sort of listening and uh, picking people's minds. And um, Kevin did such a phenomenal job in sort of really diving and giving people space to speak and space to share. So even though the panel did go over time, we did gain <laughs> from that um, passage of time. That's OK. We're going to put the pressure on the Associate Deputy Minister for Environment and Climate Change Canada now. Paul Haluka is up next as we start to wrap up day one. Over to you, Paul. We're going to invite our audience as well to keep submitting questions and to vote on those questions that other people submit, because we really want to be able to give some of that dialogue back to the stage so that we can kind of keep nodding and paying attention to what people are saying and pick up these threads so that we can carry them into day two. So let's head over now to Paul on the main stage. Thanks, Catherine. I'm excited to be here and to share the stage with some of Canada's leaders in circular economy. Hello, Mark. Hello, Joanne. And hello to you, Sophia. Thank you for joining us from Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I'm just going to say a word on format before we get into the questions. So we're going to have three questions. I'm going to turn to Sophia first, then I'm going to turn to Mark and then Joanne. Uh, and then we are going to have a lightning round question, which we'll, we will keep it to a lightning round. And then we're going to have some audience questions that will be fed in by our uh, excellent, uh, our excellent hosts for the uh, the day. So I'm going to start off with Sophia first. I'll start with you, uh, Sophia. You are the founder and executive director of Threading Change, a youth-led ethical fashion organization, working at the intersections of climate, gender racial justice and the circular economy. A recurring message from today's speakers has been that we need to connect the dots, the dots between our social, economic, environmental goals. This, as, uh, this is easier said than done. Uh, what message do you have for decision makers who are working to ensure that everyone, particularly future generations, benefit from a circular transition? Thank you for the question, Paul, and thanks to ECCC and Citra for this opportunity. 
being able to be here with all of you today, speaking about the secure economy from the perspective of a youth-led not-for-profit threatening change foundation is definitely a step in the right direction. I think it's critically important that decision makers in every level of government and industry recognize the importance of meaningfully including youth voices and perspectives, not only in these discussions, but also in boardrooms, in waste plants and facilities, and on the ground in communities as well. If we truly want to benefit future generations in a secure transition, we need to realize that we're not doing this for the future, but really for today. With the latest IPCC report that just came out a month ago, it's vital to know that we truly don't have much time left at all. Thankfully, from today's discussions, it's evident that we do have the tools in order to transition our economy to a circular one. However, this is not possible without robust collaboration with governments, industry, consumers, regulators, and especially Indigenous knowledge keepers and also Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. The message you want to tell decision makers are, are we truly giving space and allowing these marginalized communities to take ownership and stand up in order to actualize a soccer economy? Or are we irresponsibly dumping our waste from the global north due to our greedy consumption patterns into the global south, using their valuable land as a dumping ground? Do we have enough representation from the global south pers perspectives in conversations around the soccer economy today? It's time that we actively decolonize the governing and sacral engagement practices, holding space who have lived experience beyond just Western science. A surrogate transition needs to happen with meaningful including everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. My next question is for you, Mark. In listening to the conversations today, uh, we've noticed, and I'm sure uh, those participating have noticed, an underlying tension between competing visions for circular economies, with some arguing for a hyper-local approach, others for a global scale circular economy. As the president and CEO of the Council of the Great Lakes Region, a network of organizations from both sides of Canada and U.S. border, what's your perspective on this issue? What, do, what role do local, regional, and national governments need to play? Well, thanks for the question, Paul. It's, it's, it's a great one. Um, obviously, as we think about that issue, um, when we look at uh, you know, resource recovery, resource efficiency, when we look at how do we ensure that the valuable products we use in our, in, our, in our economy and to make sure that they never become waste and even worse, that it never becomes litter or pollution, you know, we need to be working at a number of different scales because when you think about the collection, the processing, the end markets that are required to really uh, achieve better outcomes in terms of that resource efficiency, you, know, you need local governments um, you know, really working hard uh, at their level. You need provincial governments and you need the federal governments. Uh, and I would argue even global, uh, globally governments need to be coming together to make sure that when we're shifting from that, that linear take, make, dispose economy to that circular economy, that we are aligning international trade to the way that we look at um, how we use materials across the country like Canada, and then ultimately how do we collect, process them, and create those markets at, uh, at that um, local provincial scale. And I think when I look at Canada um, over the last couple of years, the approach has been comprehensive. I think the federal government has taken action where it can. Legislatively, we've seen innovation challenges through uh, innovation science and economic development, your old department. Um, but we've also seen the federal government work with the provinces through the Canadian Councils and Ministers of the Environment and really trying to uh, pursue a vision of a zero waste future, particularly when it comes to plastics. We're only recovering 9% of our plastics in Canada. So there's a resource recovery challenge there. Um, and even for us as an organization, when you look at a region like the binational Great Lakes region, Ontario, Quebec, eight Great Lakes states, that's a $6 trillion economy. There are many sectors and, and supply chains that cut across that border. Uh, we need to organize at that level too because that's where the, uh, you know, the economy is, is functioning on a normal level. So I, I think to, to answer your question, we need to be really connecting and collaborating across all those different levels of government. And I dare say that we also need to look at how the circular economy is embedded in our international trade framework in a much different way than what we've seen in the past. Thank you, Mark. Joanne, you are the executive director of the Circular Innovation Council, which champions using buying power to accelerate the circular economy. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, we looked at the power of conscious consumerism at the individual level, and I, and I and I'm sure many of the participants were struck by how many of the strategies would have been common practice only a few generations ago. Do you see something similar happening in terms of government and businesses opting to reduce consumption and waste through behavior and process changes, rather through an adoption of new technologies or products? Thanks, Paul, for the question. Uh, we absolutely believe that um, the, the discussions around consumption and production at every level are critical to shifting markets. 
And we think that governments at all levels actually have a, a really important uh, leadership role that they can play in demonstrating how they can shift markets. So um, moving from this idea of being price takers and, and, and uh, not only decoupling um, uh, uh, you know, or only focusing on economic value. What we've heard in in spades today is how we have to actually look at redefining what we mean by value, not just price, and uh, using procurement power um, to demonstrate how you can actually deliver on the social and environmental values that were exposed throughout the day today. And we think that uh, governments, um, uh, you know, the GDP of uh, public procurement in Canada is more than 15 percent, so a very powerful uh, position for government to be in to shape those markets and deliver on uh, circularity over linear uh, business models. Okay, so lightning round time. For our remaining time, I want to focus in on Canada. The theme for the uh, WCEF 2021 is game changers, and we want to focus in on what we can do in the next five years. Of the game changers that were identified today, what, which can we adopt here in Canada? and which would need to be adjusted to fit our context. So for this round, we're gonna go in reverse order. So Joanne, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, you know, I think going back to this theme about just a transition in production and consumption um, and, and uh, connecting it to, to value for me was a theme that I heard throughout. Um, and and what, what that really helps us repurpose is irrespective of sector, private or public, irrespective it's the individual, the business or the government, um, you know, really uh, uh, supporting uh, entrepreneurs and businesses that are uh, in industries that are, are deriving a new way to supply goods um, uh, and services into the market, to me, is fundamentally a game changer. So I wouldn't say there's one sector or one business over another, not even one level of consumption, but I think broadly uh, uh, looking at aligning value, redefining value, and then this idea of, of what we need over what we want should be a theme uh, throughout. Okay. Mark. Yeah, great question, Paul. So I think when I look at where do we go over the next five years, uh, innovation, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for Canada uh, in North America, you know, both in terms of how do we think about the materials we create, so green chemistry, how do we build sustainability into the products that we create. Uh, we also need major innovations in the technologies that we use for that uh, collection processing recovery side of things. Today in our material recovery facilities, we're using technology that was designed over 20 years ago. Um, our waste streams have become a lot more complex. So I think uh, really looking at how do we innovate on that technology side, the re recovery side is going to be important. Um, I would also say that we also need to do a much better job of working together uh, from a public-private standpoint in, and ultimately investing in not only the infrastructure that's going to be required to support that collection and processing in those new end markets, but also, um, you know, how do we work together to make sure that the, the, the money is supporting that, that modernization. There's no one level of government, there's no one sector that's going to be able to do it on, our, on its own. So I think looking at how do we finance and fund the circular economy is going to be critically important. And then I think lastly, which was mentioned before our panel, is how do we support small and medium-sized enterprises in that transition to a circular economy? Multinational companies that work on a global stage, they have it figured out. But the majority of our economy is run by small, medium-sized enterprises. So how do we get them thinking about sustainability? How do we get them thinking about circularity? And giving them the tools and the capacity, the support that they need to be able to make that transition along with the economy. Thank you, Mark. And you're saying the word innovation very, very frequently, which is excellent. Sophia, can I turn to you next? Yes, absolutely. Um, great question, Paul. So innovation-wise, I think it's critically important that philanthropic, philanthropic organizations, all levels of government and corporations don't leave youth behind. We are a main game changer in a circular economy transition. And young people frequently get left behind due to a severe lack of resources and funding. It's time that we fund innovative youth organizations, startups, and other projects that are leading the way in a circular economy transition. There are especially barriers to funding for BIPOC-led organizations. As an equity-based organization, 30 
Green Change has talked to countless representatives in the not-for-profit sector about this struggle. We would love the opportunity to actively engage in conversation with decision makers, with all the other youth-led organizations on how we can change this. This will be a great focus to implement within the next five years. Community action and behavior change is also very important, for studies have shown that one of the biggest motivators of household sustainability mechanisms and individual, individual behavior and accountability comes from seeing what your next door neighbor is doing. Hmm. There are research groups currently at the University of British Columbia who are looking into how we can strengthen climate action via neighborhood discourse. I strongly believe that local communities and municipalities can implement fun challenges and contests between neighbors in the community to drive that individual behavior to truly move us to a circular model. Thank you. Okay. So maybe just a, a follow-on question. Uh, what does a uniquely Canadian brand of a circular economy look like? Where do we start? And I'll go around again, uh, perhaps starting to my uh, Pick to on my me right. first. Sure, yes. absolutely. Yeah, I think we have uh, this, um, uh, this, this, this uh, unique resource-based economy. And, and the juxtaposition to that is that we have such a uh, pride around our natural environment um, and, and our environment and, and our biodiversity. And so, um, you know, I think that is unique to Canada. But there's an opportunity there um, to ensure that we actually um, consider the value of our natural environment first and maybe addressing this unfortunate um, disposal issue that we have where really you know the resources that we're pulling out of our natural world that we're using for production cycles we're only getting nine percent of them back into production of new products um, uh, and so you know with, with that triangulation I think we really have to look at um, uh, you know as Mark has, has, has identified how can we invest in, in, in startups how can we support in scale-ups and how do we identify you know, new business opportunities um, local to Canada to try to repurpose that waste that's going into disposal first so that we are actually not um, protecting uh, our natural capital and the natural resources that are very unique to Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, um, you know, I, ultimately I think that shift to a circular economy, it, it's, it's going to be a big, big effort on the part of, of industry and, and government and I would, you know, I'd say consumers. And, you know, but ultimately I think it, it's, it's going to be good for the environment, it's going to be good, for, even better for the economy if we can work together to make that orderly transition. And I think the unique spot that Canada is in is, as Joanne was indicating, is um, you know we are a natural resource-based economy in many ways, but we were also seeing the emergence of some really powerful uh, technology-based uh, clusters across the country and data science, data analytics. And I think when we start putting together those strengths, um, it really positions us uniquely to play a strong role in embedding those strengths into our how we think about circularity in the Canadian context. Another advantage for Canada is that we are a trading nation. So I think playing a leading role in terms of what does circularity look like in our relationship with the European Union, what does it look like in our relationship with the Asia Pacific, um, but also what does it look like in the context of our trading partnership with the United States. Yeah. You know, Ontario derives 30% of its GDP from doing business across the border with the eight Great Lakes states and, and beyond. And so what does the circular economy look like or how does it reimagine those, those uh, cross-border economies? You know, Canada can play a leading role and, and maybe for once, uh, Canada pulling the United States along uh, as opposed to the United States pulling Canada along on some of its policy priorities. So I think there's a great opportunity for Canada on a number of fronts. Thank you, Mark. Sophia? So I think um, Canada is a very multicultural country with immigrants from around the world, which means our nation is diverse with rich perspectives, ways of living, and also solutions for a secure economy. It's imperative that we don't let this diversity go to waste. I think we own it to ourselves to have our transition be as diverse as we are, to actively engage uh, racially, economically, and in socially diverse communities to see what's possible. We're currently at a turning point in our nation, with September 30th now officially being named Truth and Reconciliation Day. And today we also did have discussions um, with the conference about indigenomics. I think it's important we recognize that when you have a cognitive shift of how we see the land, something that's not just dead material, something that we just don't detract from or extract from, and that to take away the belief that our, our landscapes have to be used and extracted and to ultimately decolonize our understanding of labor from an intersectional lens. I think there's so many amazing indigenous leaders and leaders from all levels of government, industry, and also other foundations that have shown what's possible. But I think it's also really important that we actively engage the community and our neighbors to see how we can truly make our transition circular. Thank you very much. So 
Next is the audience questions. So these ones we uh, we will these will be surprises to us as well. So we're <laughs> we have a few minutes left. Let's see what our audience wants to know. Perfect. Um, so this is really interesting. I'm loving the discussion that's currently happening. And what's really fascinating is this is one of the sessions that is almost entirely North American in terms of our audience, because it's just so late in, uh, in Europe and in, uh, in Europe, Africa, and sort of the rest of the world. So uh, we've got time for one question. I've got one question for each of you, and it's the same question. If our audience, who is currently listening to us right now, you know, we've ingested and digested so much information across the day and throughout um, this incredible panel. And so if the audience takes away just one line, one learning piece, one component from each of you, if the audience is to learn one thing from each of you, what would it be? I'd like to start off with Joanne, and then we'll go to Mark and then Sophia. Sorry, I'm going to have to get the question think, repeated. Yeah, I think we, if we could maybe have the questions again, Chuck, it just was pretty Absolutely. hard to so hear. So the question is, if there is just one line um, that everyone sort of takes away, one key learning piece from each of you, um, what would that be? Oh, okay. So one learn key, one key learning mm. insight from each of you. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think I fundamentally have to go back to the sentiment of of uh, redefining what it is that we value, um, and to connecting how we consume to those values. So you know, beyond cost and price, and I think we have to mirror our our consumption habits and models to really thinking about um, the drain of our own impacts as consumers on, uh, on, on the natural world and certainly its effects on environment and, and, and our social well-being. Okay, that's a great one. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, I think my response would be, I think when we, when we think about the take, make, dispose linear economy and that shift to a circular economy, that is a complete remaking of how we do business and you know, how we consume things as a society. And I think the only way that we're going to achieve that circular future is really through partnerships and collaboration. Whether it's government, whether it's industry, academia, it's going to have to come about through really deep partnerships across the economy and society. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Sophia, last, last word to you in British Columbia. Thank you. Um, I would say what I would want everyone to know in the key takeaway message is that it's definitely that we all work in, together, in, together in collaboration, but also recognizing that um, we can't forget those who came before us. And the concept of circular economy is not one that's new. It's one that many different communities have had for generations and millennia. So it's important that we learn from that traditional ecological knowledge, that we learn from lived experience, that we talk to those who have come before us um, who have this great amount of knowledge to see what's possible. And I also want to say that I think it's important that, you know, especially for young people, don't think of yourselves as the leaders of tomorrow. You are the leaders of today. You have the tools in your toolkit. You have the innovation possibilities. And there's so many different opportunities out there for you to go ahead and make change in the world on a secure level. So I really encourage you to do so beyond just individual action, but also on community-based action and demanding systemic change as well. Thank you, Sophia. That's a wonderful uh, sentiment on which to end the conversation. And I want to thank all of the uh, panelists for, for their participation today. It's been a great conversation. And I look forward to working with all of you to create a more circular economy. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much to Paul and Sophia and Mark and Joanne. Before we sign off for the day, let's take a look at the work of our talented graphic facilitator, Alina Gutierrez. We've been joking about her talent for the last couple of days, you should all know, and now you get to see it uh, on the screen there before you. Um, she's trying to capture words and meaning, trying to tie things together. She's going to be continuing to work on this over the next day or so, and we will revisit this piece of art as we continue our conversations in the day ahead. So you get some rest tonight, my friend, and we are going to wrap up for today. Take care, everyone, morning, noon, or night, and we will see you on Canadian time tomorrow morning. Bon matin, by en effet, bon soirée tout le monde. So, uh, goodbye to everyone. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for an excellent day.